Um, but with no further ado, a proper introduction, Jonathan, to you. Thank you so much for being here from Cambridge. Um, and your title is uh, The Wesleyan Theological Tradition, What is Evangelical Arminianism? Over to you. Thank you very much, Steve. <laughs> Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be with you. Uh, I'm, I'm always to be invited uh, to, to give you this talk this evening. Um, as Edward says, I, I teach theological students in Cambridge. Um, I'm the vice principal of Wesley House, which is the uh, Methodist Theological College um, in Cambridge. And there I teach a mixture of pastoral studies and church history. I'm also um, the Methodist Church's Learning and Development Officer for Ministries in the Eastern Region. Uh, at the moment. Uh, so I have, I have also have a bit of a brief uh, for the training of um, local preachers and others um, around the, the six counties uh, that make up Methodist Church's eastern region. Um, and part of the reason that I have at the moment two job titles uh, is because Wesley House is changing. Um, Wesley House was established in uh, 1921 as the Methodist Church's um, college in Cambridge. Um, over the years, the Methodist Church has um, changed the way in which it trains ministers on a number of occasions. And the latest change was a decision made by the Methodist Conference in 2012 um, to unify all its training of ministers. So from uh, this year onwards, all those who offer for the Methodist ministry and are accepted are trained either at our theological college in uh, Birmingham, at the Queen's Foundation, which of course is a, a, an ecumenical uh, establishment <coughs> with the Church of England, um, either residentially there or in a non-residential program of some sort that is administered from Birmingham. Um, so the decision was made no longer to send students uh, for training at Cambridge. That left the trustees uh, of Wesley House, Cambridge, uh, with a theological college <laughs> and a trust that said these, this money has been given for the theological education of Methodists within the precincts of the University of Cambridge and no students. Uh, so they have made the decision uh, significantly to remodel the premises. Uh, and to re-establish the college, effectively, as a centre for Methodist learning uh, for Methodists all over the world. Um, and this has involved a number of, of technical um, details, um, one of which um, has been that we've had to make some changes to our trustee, uh, because the trustee says this is people who have been accepted as candidates for the ministry. Uh, and what we want to welcome are those who accept as candidates for the ministry because um, there are some accepted candidates um, who from uh, Italy or the United States of America or South Africa or elsewhere have come to Cambridge for a year as part of their training. Uh, but also for those who are already ordained uh, and who are looking to do a research degree, uh, those who have been identified by their own church as potential theological educators, um, or lay Methodists um, who want to come to Cambridge to do some sort of course of study. Um, and in order to do that, um, the trustees had to ask themselves, okay, but what is it that we're trying to say in terms that will satisfy the charity which is what we're doing? And they came up with a definition that said that the resources of the college are there um, for those who are in the Wesleyan theological tradition. And defined that as being those who are members of churches which are or are eligible to be members of the World Methodist Council. Now the World Methodist Council is a global body that brings together um, people from 80 different churches. Uh, some of which are Methodist churches, like the Methodist Church of Great Britain, the Methodist Church in Ireland, uh, the United Methodist Church in, in America and so on. Uh, some of them are uniting churches, so the churches where Methodism has a historic um, tradition as part of a, a, a larger economic grouping, Uniting Church in Australia, in Canada, uh, the churches of North and South India, for instance. And some are churches that have developed from Methodist churches, uh, so-called holiness churches, 
Uh, the Church of the Nazarene is probably the, the, the most famous. Um, and so the, the question uh, with which the trustees have been wrestling, and therefore it will be explored over and over again, is what is it? What is it of the theological tradition that holds together all these people who might want to come to Wesley House uh, as a reflective cross-cultural community of prayer and study for students and scholars in this Wesleyan tradition? And the answer that we give to that question is evangelical Arminianism. And what I hope to do is to unpack for you what we mean by evangelical Arminianism. It begins, of course, we won't be surprised to know, with somebody called Wesley, at least two people called Wesley. Um, and forgive me, I'm going to assume that you, you know nothing, so, so let me start right at the beginning. Um, John and Charles Wesley were two of the many children of an Anglican priest uh, called Samuel Wesley and his wife Susanna. Um, Samuel was uh, a rather eccentric, uh, not always popular um, rector in North Lincolnshire, uh, in the parish of Edward, uh, where both John and Charles uh, were born. And uh, as was not uncommon uh, in those days, uh, John and Charles both followed their father into the church. Uh, they went to, to the public school and then they went on to Oxford. And it was whilst they were at Oxford, and particularly while Charles, the younger brother, was at Oxford, uh, that they established uh, something that was variously called the, the Holy Club, or the Methodists. They were people who were affected by the evangelical revival that was starting in those early years of the uh, 18th century. Um, John was born in 1703, Charles in 1707. So they were both at Oxford in the late uh, 1720s, early 1730s. And the effect by the evangelical revival, John and Charles and their friends decided that they should take the practice of their religion seriously. Uh, so they engaged a number of practices uh, that were not generally popular amongst Oxford students, or indeed amongst many in the church in those days. Uh, they'd fast once a week. Uh, they would ha have rules about the use of their money and how much they gave away. They made themselves available to visit prisoners and the sick. Um, they had regular times when they met together for prayer and Bible study, and they encouraged each other uh, in what nowadays I think we probably call a cell group or something uh, in, in Oxford. And that's where the term, the, the word Methodist, originated. Skipping through the story, um, both John and Charles were engaged in a project uh, with a man called Oglethorpe to establish a, a new colony in, in America, the colony of Georgia. Uh, and they went out, Charles as secretary and John as chaplain uh, to this colony. And we'll skip over what happened there. Uh, but they came back rather unhappy uh, individuals feeling that they had failed. On the way out to Georgia, they had met a group of German Christians uh, from uh, a church called the Moravians, or the uh, Unity of Brethren. Uh, and the Moravians are a, a Protestant denomination that trace their origins back to the uh, 15th century and to, to Jan Hus, the, the great Czech uh, reformer, the pre-reformer, effectively, um, of, of the Bohemian Church. And the Moravians were part of this movement called the Evangelical, we call the Evangelical Revival, a movement that was in various places encouraging Christians to take their faith more seriously, and as a result of them taking their faith more seriously, sharing it with others. And John and Charles were immensely impressed by the Moravians. Uh, and on their return to London, they continued their association with them. And through their association with them, both uh, Charles I and then John had experiences uh, that we sometimes call their evangelical conversions. Experiences in which they felt an assurance of their own salvation and a burning desire to share the good news of their of salvation with others. As a result 
um, of those experiences, and as a result of their association with one of their Oxford friends, uh, a man by the name of George Whitfield, and we'll meet Whitfield again later on, um, John and then Charles became involved in open-air preaching uh, in travelling around the country, um, preaching to groups of people who effectively were sort of disenfranchised by the parish churches. Um, we're now in the mid-18th century. Um, the uh, conversion experiences took place in 1738. Just at the beginning of the agrarian revolution, uh, the population of England in the 18th century was growing rapidly. Uh, and the parish system was creeping under the strain. Large number of people were moving uh, as uh, at the beginning of mechanization and the increased need for, for, for coal and other mineral resources were moving into new industrial sorts of stuff, uh, 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 um, communities. Uh, and it was to those sort of people, initially the Kingswood miners, um, that the Wesley brothers preached. And over the rest of uh, their life, they devote themselves to ministry uh, in this evangelical course, which led to the creation of what came to be called the Methodist Societies. Drawing together that evangelical zeal that they picked up from the Moravians and the 1738 experience and the discipline of the Oxford early, early club days. Um, and that led to the establishment of uh, what can be called the Methodist Connection. Now Wesley, and I'll come back to this point, John Wesley, or if you is not a church, it was, it was not a separate denomination, this was a connection of societies that existed to encourage people in their faith. And it existed through um, a pattern of society meetings where people would gather to sing hymns and to um, hear sermons, uh, and band or class meetings where they would gather together in small groups to encourage each other. John was a brilliant organiser. He created this, this system, he held it all together throughout his life and lived a very long time, he died in 1791. Charles, as you're probably aware, was a great poet and wrote something in excess of 8,000 verses uh, which many of which still survive as hymns uh, that we sing. And, you, know, you can probably think of the popular wrestling hymns, um, Heart the Held Angels Sing, um, And Can It Be, O Thou Who Camest From Above, uh, Forth in Thy Name, O Lord I Go. Um, now, this is where I, I stick my neck. I think that what is distinctive about Methodism, and what is particularly distinctive about British Methodism, owes, it is created not in the 18th century, but in the 19th century. Because three things happened in the 19th century. And the first was that Methodism came into being as a world church. Most, I mean, there are something like 80 million Methodists who in some way or other identified with the World Methodist Council around the world today. So approximately, the, the, the membership of the Methodist Church worldwide is approximately the same as the um, Anglican community. But only something like a quarter of a million of those 80 million are British Methodists in this country. Uh, the vast majority of them uh, owe their, their ecclesial heritage to the Methodist Church in the United States. Uh, the United Methodist Church, the largest uh, and the most powerful Methodist Church in the world. Uh, and the Methodist Church in the United States came to being as a result of Wesley's actions after the War of Independence. Uh, the American War of Independence, of course, saw a severing of the links of the colony with the Crown and therefore with the Church of England. And Wesley made the decision in 1784 that in order that people might be provided with what they needed spiritually in the new nation, he would ordain people for work in uh, the, what had been the American colonies, the new United States of America. Uh, and so two individuals, uh, Thomas Coke and Francis Asbury, uh, established as what Wesley called general superintendents, and they very quickly called bishops uh, in, in, the, the, in the United States. But Methodism grew in other parts of the world as well. 
And as in the 19th century, uh, the British Empire spread, so did the Methodist Church. Typical story, just one example. Um, was the work that was established in South Africa in an area called Brackenby Valley. That is a little Methodist chapel in Lincolnshire, a place called Breakby. Um, we are told, uh, I'm heard out to leave here, that Wesley himself preached there. Uh, Wesley was a great friend of the squire of Breakby, uh, Robert Brackenbury, um, who established that chapel, built that chapel for him um, out of his stable hall uh, in the uh, late 18th century. Brackenbury's widow funded missionary activity in South Africa, in a place that's now called Brackenbury Valley. Uh, and so at the, uh, the, the bicentenary of those endeavours, uh, some of the, the Methodists from South Africa came back to uh, on pilgrimage to Rafe in Lincolnshire, and we were privileged to meet them and get them. And there are those sorts of links all over the world uh, that were established in the 19th century. So what happens in the 19th century is that the Methodism expands and uh, becomes effectively uh, a global uh, branch of Christendom. The second thing that happens in the 19th century is that Methodism in Britain divides. It shatters into pieces. Um, it happened time and time and time again. Um, the first occasion was um, in so the, the, before the end of the 18th century actually, uh, in 1797, uh, a man called Alexander Killam complained about the lack of demo democracy in the Methodist movement. Uh, and he left to establish what became known as the Methodist New Connection. Uh, Wesley, when he died, had left a will um, that said that there was to be a conference of a hundred of his preachers um, who would make the decisions about the, 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 the um, connection each year. Um, Killam did not agree with the decisions that they were making and he did not agree with the mechanism by which those decisions were made and so he established his own uh, branch of mechanism. More significant was the um, break in the first decade of the 19th century when that man there, Hugh Bourne, uh, was a young Methodist lay preacher. And incredibly, given um, the history of the, the movement, Bourne was denied permission to preach uh, in the open air at a camp meeting. <laughs> um, the, the, the practice of camp meetings, uh, of people preaching in the open air for days on end, and people going to the camp, sort of, I don't know, late 18th, early 19th century spring harvest or something, I think it was, um, had, had, had spread in the, the, in the United States and, and uh, was coming to Britain again. Uh, and the Methodists in the potteries um, were opposed to the camp meeting movement, didn't want their preachers to have anything to do with it, and so Hugh Bourne found himself expelled. And he and an associate, William Clowes, um, said that they were the true, effectively, the, the inheritors of the Western tradition. They called themselves primitive Methodists, and, um, and, and, and the, there was the growth of another connection. And so it goes on. People fell out over all sorts of things. Um, but we find it slightly um, ironic that, what, 180 years ago, they fell out over whether or not there should be a theological college. They also <laughs> fell out over whether or not there should be an organ in a church in Leeds. Uh, but in 1849, there was a major, major falling out. Um, the secretary of the Methodist Conference was a man called Jabez Bunting, um, who uh, acquired to himself uh, a certain amount of opprobrium. Uh, and there was uh, opposition to Bunting, who was thought to be a dictator. Um, there was a, a massive controversy of people writing pamphlets called fly sheets um, against uh, the Methodist uh, leadership particularly Bunting, uh, there was an investigation, three individuals were expelled and established what became the Western Reformed Union uh, and the United, what became known to be called some of the United Methodist Churches. So, I mean, with my students, they used to have a chart where they saw these divisions. Most of those movements came back together in the um, 1932 Union that created the Methodist Church in Great Britain. Okay. Two significant bodies, a number of small bodies, but two significant bodies uh, were left out of value. One was the Western Reformed Union, 
and the other was the Salvation Army, which itself was a splinter of the Methodist New Connection. Um, and the third thing that happened in the 19th century was that Methodism became a non-conformist denomination. Um, although Wesley liked to maintain uh, throughout that he was an Anglican, uh, that he was doing nothing with his loyal to the Church of England, um, he was really establishing more people was started to regard as a church. He encouraged the Methodists to continue to go to the parish church. He decreed, as he was wont to decree, that Methodist meetings should not be held at the same hour as the church service, so that people would both go to their parish church for communion and go uh, and and, and so. But many Methodists were dissatisfied with this um, and began to see the person who preached to them as being effectively their, their, their minister. And so within the first few decades of the 19th century, it became quite clear that Methodists were not Anglican societies, they were effectively a non-conformist denomination. That their buildings were licensed that uh, they started to call their, their, mini their ministers started to dress uh, as, as, pre as priests or, or as, uh, as Anglican presbyters in, in bands and gowns. Um, the, uh, in the 1830s, uh, the West Indies actually started to ordain their ministers uh, by the laying on of hands. Uh, so effectively, it established itself as, as a church. Established itself as a church at the same time as a massive growth of population in these islands. Uh, and a time when other non conformist denominations were growing rapidly. Uh, in 1851, there was a church census. Same time as the national census, the government decided to count how many people go to church. It was a bit horrified to discover that slightly under half the population went to church at all on the Sunday encounter. Uh, but what it did find was that nearly half of those who did go went to Protestant non-conformist denominations, of which by that point the various Methodist denominations were the largest group. Uh, but uh, this was the 19th century was a century in which the Congregationalists, the Presbyterians, uh, the, the Baptists of general, uh, of different views, all grew uh, in August. Many, many smaller Protestant denominations uh, sprang up. Really. And by the end of the 19th century, there was very, a very strong identity that those groups held in common, that came to be known as non-conformity. Methodists always deny that they are dissenters. <laughs> we are not dissenters, but we are non-conformists. That is to say, uh, we do not conform to those things that were in the Old Testament Corporation Act that said that you know, in order to, because there was a time in the, from the 18th, 17th century onwards, where in order to hold public office, you had to be recognized as a member of the Church of England. And you did that by conforming, by going to communion twice a year. Uh, and and uh, so there were those who did not conform. Um, method, uh, and so Methodists became non-conformist, though the mm. Test of Corporation Acts were repealed. And by the end of the 19th century, non Protestant non-conformist Christianity in this country was a significant Force. Um, it is reckoned that it was the non-conformist vote that effectively won the Liberals in the 1906 election. Uh, and um, symbolic of that was the figure of Hugh Price Hughes, uh, the minister who established the West London Mission in London, who campaigned uh, for a number of social causes as a Methodist minister, writing newspaper articles, uh, preaching. Um, holding public meetings, uh, lobbying the government on a variety of issues. Um, the, there was the, the famous incident when, um, as Gladstone was trying to create um, a, a solution to the Ireland problem, uh, it was discovered that the leader of the Irish MPs, uh, Charles Parnell, uh, had been having the theft. Uh, and uh, Hugh Price Hughes thundered that Parnell should resign. Uh, that what was privately unacceptable could not be politically right. Uh, and it's reckoned that was the significant voice that changed uh, the course of affairs in those political debates. That's how, that's how influential Protestant nonconformity was at the end of 
the 19th century. And Methodism was the largest of possible nonconformist groups. And what that means is that effectively Methodists now hold together two aspects of their ecclesial tradition. This is the Methodist Church in Yard, uh, but it could be any number of other places. What do you notice about it? Yarn. Yarn, down near Stockton, or teasing, um, What do you notice about it? Pulpit Central. Pulpit Central. <coughs> yeah? Yeah? So is the old Yes. <laughs> <laughs> this is a place that is designed for the singing of hymns and the preaching of sermons. Yeah? It's designed with pews that effectively cram into as much of the available space as possible, so that you can get the maximum number of people in to do that. Yeah? Uh, the communion table is that little table seat to the, sitting at the bottom of the pulpit, dominated by the cross. Yeah? Now that is typical, not just of Methodist, but of other non-conformist architecture of the 19th century. Yeah? Um, pretty much what, you know, I, I did my homework, what um, Paul Beasley Murray described to you <laughs> yeah, a couple of months ago when he talked about Baptist churches. The other tradition I think is represented by our worship book, uh, which is the collection of Methodist printed liturgies. Methodists are not obliged to use printed liturgies, but we have authorised liturgies, and we have, a, I think, a very fine collection now of, of printed liturgies uh, for the sacraments, for preaching services, um, for uh, pastoral officers, um, and so on. Uh, they, they're bound together with the uh, revised common lectionary in an only st uh, a version that's only very slightly different from that which is used in the Church of England and in the Roman Catholic Church. Um, and Brent presents uh, a traditional Methodism that never lost sight of its Anglican roots. So throughout the 19th century, there were Methodist churches where the main service was Matins from the BCP. Uh, John Wesley published his own version of the Book of Common Prayer for the American Methodists. Um, he reduced the number of articles to uh, 39 to 25. <laughs> he took out the bits that he did not like, but he said that there was nothing, nothing that breathes such rational scriptural piety as the Book of Common Prayer. And I think that you understand modern Methodism in the tension between those two traditions. Yeah. The one that sees its identity, so many Methodists would see themselves as being not dissimilar to whatever the local chapel folk were. Yeah. Others would see themselves very much as being, uh, as it were, the separated brothers and sisters of the Church of England that couldn't cope with them <laughs> in the 18th century. But what does unite all Methodists, however they understand themselves ecclesiologically, <coughs> is their evangelical Arminianism. Uh, Methodists have doctrinal standards. And uh, those doctrinal standards are contained for us in uh, the Deed of Union, which was the founding document of the 1932 Methodist Church in Great Britain. The Methodist Church claims and cherishes its place in the Holy Catholic Church, which is the body of Christ. It rejoices in the inheritance of the apostolic faith and loyally accepts the fundamental principles of the historic creeds and of the Protestant Reformation. It ever remembers that in the providence of God, Methodism was raised up to spread scriptural holiness through the land by the proclamation of the evangelical faith and declares its unfaltering resolve to be true to its divinely appointed mission. The doctrines of the evangelical faith which Methodism held from the beginning and still holds are based upon the divine revelation recorded in the Holy Scriptures. The Methodist Church acknowledges this revelation as the supreme rule of faith and practice. These evangelical doctrines to which the Methodist, the, sorry, to which the preachers of the Methodist Church are pledged are contained in Wesley's notes on the New Testament and the first four volumes of his sermons. And so that is essentially what, if you ask a Methodist what it is that we believe, that's what we say. We believe that we are faithful to the inheritance of the apostolic faith, that we believe what is said in the creeds, 
that we hold the fundamental principles of the Protestant Reformation. Yeah. You might find some difference as to what people think the fundamental principles of the Protestant Reformation are, but we say that we, we hold them. Uh, and that the supreme rule of our faith and practice is the revelation recorded in the Holy Scriptures. That's not to say that Methodists are necessarily biblical literalists at all. It's the revelation that is recorded there. Uh, that is, that is here. And the, the, the standard of that, which is accepted not only by the Methodist Church in Great Britain, but by the World Methodist Council and, and by the Methodist Church in the United States, are the notes of the New Testament and the 44 sermons. And all Methodist preachers, uh, lay or ordained, have been examined on Wesley's 44 sermons. Yeah? Uh, we're a bit lax now. I think we only demand that they know 12 of them. When I was uh, a visitor of the Methodist local preacher, uh, we were supposed to have read all 44 and could be examined on any one of them. Let's break down there a little bit more what we understand by these two key terms that I keep using, evangelical and Arminian. Now, I understand that when we say evangelical in this context, we mean three things. And the first is that we are grounded in the Reformation understanding of grace and faith. <coughs> Uh, and particularly influential here, I think, is Martin Luther. Luther was a great influence on, on Wesley. Um, the night that Wesley had his, his heartwarming experience in 1738, uh, it occurred when someone was reading from Luther's preference to the letter to the Romans. Uh, the Lutheran teaching was, uh, was received by Wesley both directly, he read uh, a great deal of Luther, but also indirectly through the work of the Moravians and through other German pietists, as they were called. And a lot of the evangelical revival movement was inspired by Lutheran churches uh, in, in Germany and Spain. And so Luther remained a key influence. Uh, now, I would also argue, actually, that uh, Methodism in many ways finds its grounding in the Calvinist tradition, and we'll come back to exactly how that works, but, but Luther is important. And Luther's key doctrine, that we are saved not by works, but by grace, and that we apprehend that only through faith, are absolutely crucial. Uh, whenever I uh, celebrated what Anglicans called uh, the commemoration of John Charles Wesley, I think, on May 24th, uh, and we call Aldersgate Day or Wesley Day, um, usually most of the hymns are chosen from Charles Wesley's corpus. The one that often isn't is, is uh, Martin Luther's Out of the Depths I Cry to Thee, Lord God, Only My Prayer. Um, and, and it's those central, those central notions. We are saved only by grace uh, through faith. The second thing we mean by evangelical is it's a faith, it's, a, it's an understanding of theology that focuses on soteriology, that is to say, what it is means to be saved. An understanding that our salvation and the transformation that salvation makes in a person's life is actually essential to understand the faith. Um, you know, it, Methodism was not about, uh, the early Methodism wasn't about speculation about theology at all. It was about asking what difference believing the gospel made in the lives of the people who heard it. Um, and thirdly, when we talk about evangelical, we mean that it goes with a mandate to proclaim. The good news is news that should be broadcast. Um, so so the, the, the mandate to preach the gospel, and this is what Wesley did, uh, and there he is, um, in a scene that I did wonder where we were going to reenact on the Cathedral Wall. <laughs> Famously, uh, on one occasion, excluded from the pulpit uh, in Epworth, uh, to which he had returned after his father's death, preaching from his father's tomb, because he said, This is a piece of ground for which I cannot be 
moved. Uh, but uh, it, it's a symbol of the way in which the gospel was preached um, and, and was to be proclaimed. And so by evangelical, what I, I don't mean, I don't think quite what the way in which we use the term now, which is very much shaped by the 19th century understandings of, of evangelical. Um, I understand that when we talk about Methodist as evangelical Arminianism, we're talking about them granting the Reformation, focusing on soteriology, and emphasizing the spread of the gospel. Now, that's probably less unfamiliar to you than the next bit, which is about Arminian. Arminian actually was as much a term of abuse as a label that anybody was likely to adopt themselves, but Wesley embraced it gladly. Jacob Arminius, um, there he is. Jacob Arminius was a Calvinist, a reformed minister uh, in the late 16th century. Um, he was uh, Dutch, uh, Dane, and he taught uh, in the University of Leiden. And throughout his short career, and he died before he was 50, um, throughout his short career, he was repeatedly getting into trouble for challenging Calvinist doctrine, particularly on the question of election. Calvin, you may be aware, had uncovered and uh, refined Augustine's idea of a double predestination, uh, that God in God's wisdom preordained that some should be saved, but, by token, that others should not be saved. So those who are saved are an elect. Those who are elect for the fall. More than that, God ordained this before the fall. Yeah. So God ordained the fall of Adam and the salvation of some from the damnation that was incurred by Adam's fall. And that was effectively Calvin's orthodoxy, as it was understood at the end of the 16th century. Arminius said, hang on a minute. Um, God, if God is just and if God is loving, cannot condemn some before they even are brought into existence to eternal damnation. And so he, he proclaimed an understanding of, of Protestant Christianity which focused on the idea that uh, the gospel, that salvation was uh, to be understood as having a general invitation. Not that all necessarily all would be saved, that all would have the opportunity to embrace God's grace through faith. Uh, and that although God may know who would and who would not, God does not preordain that that should be the case. And the result of that um, was that it created a fault line in the Methodist churches, in the Reformation churches, I'm sorry. Created a fault line in the Dutch Reformed Church and in other Calvinist traditions. Uh, it created a fault line in the Church of England. Uh, and in the period before the Civil War, the accusation that was, was um, made against the Caroline Divines, against the uh, William Lord and the other leaders of the Church of England, other Charles I, was that they were Arminians and not accepting of what they was understood to be the pure Calvinist doctrine, uh, particularly of Article 13. The one that won't surprise you that Wesley left out of the provision of the prayer book. Um, it, 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 in the 1780s. Um, the the fault line actually created in England, interestingly, because the Church in England sent representatives to the Synod at Dort, where uh, our minister's views were condemned. Um, and those representatives came back and said that um, the Synod had condemned it, but they'd come to the conclusion that our minister was right. Um, and it had great influence in the Church. And that influence goes on. But, I mean, it's still seen in the, the, the Restoration Church. Uh, and it, it feeds its way through to families like the Wesleys in the early 1800s. The 1700s, sorry. There's William Lord, classical example. And what it also did was create division in the evangelical revival. Between, on the one hand, the Wesley brothers, who maintained an Arminian position, uh, an offer of general salvation, and those who held to the... Um, the, 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 the uh, more 
strict Calvinist position of there being an elect. And the leaders of that latter party were particularly Selina, the Countess of Huntingdon, um, who was responsible eventually for the creation of the Countess of Huntingdon's connection, uh, another one of the free churches of the 19th century, uh, and George Whitfield, the great preacher and friend uh, of the Wesleys in Ireland. And Wesley and Whitfield felt, I mean, they, they were reconciled before the end of Whitfield's life, but there was quite a sharp division within the early Methodist movement. Um, it creates confusion in that if you go to Wales, there are churches that are described as being Calvinistic Methodist. Yeah? The Welsh Methodist Church followed uh, Hal, Howard, Hal Harris, and another of the leaders of the uh, 18th century revival, but adopted a, a Calvinist position. And so I think we can summarize the Wesleyan theological tradition. That it's a tradition that emphasizes, above all, the universality of grace. All can be saved. God's love is for all. None is excluded. It does its theology in a particular way. You remember I talked about the centrality of Scripture earlier, uh, the Bible as, as the, the principal source of, of, of our understanding of Revelation. Uh, but the Bible is understood as being interpreted in terms of uh, through uh, reason and through tradition, as indeed Richard Hooker taught, but also through experience. Uh, so there are scenes of what called the Western Quadrilateral. The phrase actually was created by an, uh, um, a 20th century scholar by the name of Albert Utler. The Western Quadrilateral, scripture, tradition, reason, and experience. And we bring all four to bear as we do our mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Tradition that emphasizes scriptural holiness that is to say the expectation that if one is a believer, it makes a difference in one's life. Uh, and that one should seek to live an holy life. And it's not also by what is famously called a Catholic spirit. Uh, that Wesley preached a famous sermon uh, on a most unlikely text uh, from the second book of Kings. It is thine heart right with mine heart, then give me thine hand. Uh, but he used it to expand the idea that um, divisions about theology should not divide us in our love for each other or in our concern for the salvation uh, of Christ's work. So that's one way thing. The other way I pinch openly from a colleague's sermon. Um, <laughs> John Barrett, um, who is one of the ministers of Wesley Church in Cambridge um, and also has been uh, the chairman of the World Methodist Council, um, John Barrett preached a gospel on, uh, uh, preached a sermon on the Gospel of John. And he said, if you wanted to summarize the Gospel of John in six words, you could do it. Because the Gospel of John is about full life for all who believe. It seems to me that that is, me is Wesleyan evangelical Arminianism. Full life, not only about the Gospel of, of, of eternal salvation, but about a transforming experience that means that the life, your life can be lived wholly for God. And Wesley even thought, taught that people could become perfect in, in, in terms of their sanctity. Um, for, life, for all, there is no limit uh, to any who will, will receive this, who believe. Faith remains central. And that, my friends, in six words, is what evangelical Arminianism is. <laughs> Jonathan, thank you so much. That was brilliant, wasn't it? Yes. Absolutely wonderful. Yes. Thank you. Um, and if you're happy, we now have a bit of time for some uh, engagement, some questions. Um, and uh, certainly I've got a few things noticed here which I'll, I'll, I'll perhaps bring to the fore in a moment. But does anyone have anything to start us off? Yes, Ian. You're so brilliant at summarising. Could you summarise perfection? <laughs> <laughs> What Wesley, Wesley taught uh, about perfection was that there is no limit to what the grace of God can do in perfect life. Uh, and he, he issued a number of tracts and preached sermons on this. Essentially what he said was that the perfect person is one who never knowingly breaks a commandment. Yeah? So they're not perfect in their knowledge and they're not necessarily perfect in any other physical or, or other respects but actually, in terms of living faithfully, 
they do no harm. He also said there were very, very few people. He believed he met one or two. Um, <laughs> but he said very, very few people. But, he's, but the, the, the point of principle, I think, was that logically there is no limit to what God's grace can do in a person's life. That's what he wants. Would about. they need to confess their sins in any sense, do you think? Well, those, those rare people? The, those rare people. I think, I think that the, the point of the, 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 the Methodist classes or bands, particular bands, was actually to encourage people to that point. Um, I mean, what's interesting, what Wesley did was he inherited a tradition that was very much about um, examination of one's own behaviour that came from the Calvinists. But that was about sort of checking whether or not one was or was not one of the elect. Now, because he rejected that notion, what he did was to adopt the means but actually say this is about moving oneself and one's brothers and sisters towards uh, scriptural complete holiness sanctification, uh, perfection. So one would still be a member of a band, but, you know, yeah. um, maybe when one, it, it, one of the things that's interesting is the question, he used to ask his questions uh, to those bands. So, um, you know, things like, um, have we taken snuff this week? Mm -hmm. <laughs> have, we, have we partaken of drugs? Um, interesting after a conversation with dinner, have we used our language? <laughs> those sort of questions yeah. just come in. And so there's that examination. So presumably, you know, one could as it were, any other questions? Yes. Could you explain to me anyway exactly what was Calvin trying was Calvin trying to uncover the elect those who were elect? What I mean, what was the <coughs> And if he didn't uncouple them, no, no. would they not be elected? I don't know. Thank you. Um, I, I, I wouldn't claim to be a great expert on John Calvin at all. What Calvin's concern was the sovereignty of God. Yeah. So what Calvin wanted to do was to make it clear who God is that we are called to worship. And logically, that moves to a position where if God, is, if God is God, then what thing we know for sure is that we are not like God in many respects. You know, there's, there's something fundamentally wrong with our human condition. And the explanation of why that is cannot be that this is in any sense uh, because God has got it wrong. Because God is God and God is sovereign. Um, therefore, there is um, uh, God has foreordained that those that make what God wants to be made will be elect. Uh, it's all about the sovereignty, the sovereign will of God. Uh, now, the question I think you know, we're asking is well, why they preach? You know, if there's an elect that already, you know, whatever we do, no so God. The answer is to do with the irresistibility of grace. Yeah? If, um, if the grace is irresistible, then it is irresistible to be preached, as well as irresistible to be received. So the church still has a mandate to proclaim the gospel in order that those whom God has foreordained might hear and receive it. But I, mean, I think Calvin would agree ultimately with Augustine that we don't know who those are. I was wondering slightly whether um, John Wesley was influenced by Augustine at all, or, or, or in what ways? You mentioned about the Lutheran influence, of course Luther was an Augustinian monk originally. Yes, you know, so everybody's influenced by Augustine. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. But in different yes, ways. Indeed, indeed. <clears throat> I think, it was, I think you know, Wesley also holds a, a great doctrine of the sovereignty of God and, and the power of grace. Um, it's simply on that notion of predestination. I think that, that, that he, he, he differs from that. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, he would help. Um, um, you know, the, the one criteria for joining the Methodist movement was a desire to flee from the wrath to come. So he holds that fundamental Augustinian notion that, you know, humanity is under judgment, effectively. Um, he just differs on that point of, of, of election. 
I'd love to ask a question uh, slightly different. Um, but you mentioned that um, Methodist churches and Methodist ministers aren't obliged to use any particular authorised liturgies, although, of course, there is the book, which I think I have a copy of at home, and it's very useful sometimes. Um, although, as an Anglican, that's probably illegal. So I'm not to mention that. In, in informal ways. Um, but um, that's something I slightly envy you, actually, that, that, um, that you're not bound to use authorised liturgies, except, of course, you, you can use them when that's good, but, but you could stray from them in, in godly ways. Because as Anglicans, we're, we're not supposed to do that. Indeed, when we swear our oath of allegiance when we're, when we're signed in, you know, um, we, we promise to use only the authorised formularies. Yes. I'm not sure I've ever met anyone who's <laughs> actually kept that promise absolutely <laughs> strict. <laughs> Um, but um, but it's an interesting point. And what does I mean? I mean, on, on the on the on the principle, if you had anything to say, that would be great. But actually, in terms of the practice of the church, how does that play out? What does it mean in terms of of the um, of the, the worshiping lives of, of Methodist churches? Um, I think there the, are the two things. Here. One is that um, most Methodist services are taken by lay people. So somewhere between two thirds and three quarters of most services in most circuits will be taken by local preachers or authorised worship leaders. Uh, and it tends to be the case that they do not use uh, the, the printed liturgies, that most worship will be structured in some way or other around a pattern of um, hymns or songs and prayers and readings, uh, usually um, devised by the preacher or worship leader, but often following a pattern that, that may be accepted in that, that place. And indeed, some Methodist churches uh, will, will, will have the patterns that they have developed locally. Um, so. um, going alongside that, uh, it also follows that um, most Methodist churches will celebrate the Eucharist usually once a month at each of their services. Uh, so if the church has one service, then usually the Eucharist serve them as well. Um, the worship book is most likely to be used for the Eucharist, um, but by no means in both. Uh, and one will find that in some Methodist churches, um, the minister has devised his or her own liturgy. In others, they'll be drawing on the traditions of Iona or Teze or, or, or some other pattern. And Methodist congregations will always tell you, I think, that they value that variety. Um, I mean, it's interesting that even in the, the, the Methodist worship book, you can feel that there's a tension. Uh, and one of the ways in which they've resolved that is by providing different services of Holy Communion for each of the seasons of the year. And three alternatives for ordinary time. And then a page that says, uh, and if you don't want to use any of these, these are the principles <laughs> that you should follow. Yeah. 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 Um, now, I mean, that means that you know some of us worry um, that um, you know, what is is happening in Methodist churches sometimes doesn't follow good liturgical practice, but it does mean that there's there's a tremendous energy and and, and uh, potential to create. Them. And one of the things we do in, in theological colleges is we make sure that we expose our students to both. So we'll use the worship book, but on other occasions we will encourage them to, to form their own liturgies, to practice writing Eucharistic prayers, um, to, to think about ways in which, it, imaginatively, we can, we can engage with people in worship. Excuse me, Edward, can I say something? Though? Please because, do, but I was hoping um, you might, yes. I'm not a particular enthusiast about the worship book, um, but I do use it. I alternate. So that one month I use the worship book for communion, and the next month I either write something myself or use something from Iona or Lindisfarne, um, or a mixture. Um, because there are some people, like Keith, who's one of our organists, likes the worship book. Our other organist absolutely hates it, and the congregation is probably split along those lines, that there are people who are not all Methodist. You see, most Methodist churches now are full of people who aren't all Methodists. Um, you know, we, uh, we've got Anglicans, Catholics, Methodists, Baptists, United Reform, all consider themselves members of Trinity Methodist Church. And so you, you've got to hold in tension, you know, the, the differences. 
Um, but to be fair to everyone, I try to please all of the people some of the time. <laughs> um, but when we've got the freedom to do that. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yes, a couple of hands. So here first. Is that all we said? One, one of the printed orders of service that you spoke of is actually a sun you, as well, isn't it? Uh, yes, yeah. sort yeah. of. Indeed, sort of. Yes, yes. Could, could I ask a question? I mean, it was sort of genetic almost with the Wesleys that um, they took the gospel outside of the church doors. Um, do you think that perhaps in the intervening period um, within the Methodist Church we tend to have shut our doors a little bit more? Uh, and there may be a lesson to be learned, not just from Methodists, but away from anything at the moment. What happened in the 19th century was that not only did the Methodist Church grow exponentially, and it, it came to look more and more like the other uh, non-conformist denominations, it also created what I call the chapel culture. Uh, and the chapel culture uh, invited people effectively to, to live the whole of their lives around the chapel. Uh, so um, they'd go for um, services, and they'd go to some with children, they'd go to Sunday school, and then during the week there'd be something on every night. A woman's meeting, a men's meeting, uh, a temperance meeting, um, a, a choir, a, a, a missionary meeting, or whatever. And it seems actually that um, because the churches, largely through population growth, actually, the, church, the churches continue to grow, uh, and they devoted so much energy into keeping this, this range of social activities going, actually, that uh, you know, there, was, there was less evangelistic zeal in the 19th century. I think, I think that, that, that's definitely the case. Um, yes. I mean, the, there has always been a tradition that, you know, that isolated individuals have tried to maintain um, to continue to preach in the open air. So you know, Donald Soper did it throughout his life. In, 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 in <coughs> um, but what Methodists have also always said is um, preaching in the open air worked in the 18th century because that's what was going on, actually. It may not have worked so well in the 19th century when you had far more buildings and you actually had more buildings than you needed in the 19th century. Uh, in the 20th century, the means of communication are different and they are again in the 21st century. Um, a slightly different aspect. What is the Methodist position on what one might say called initiation, and baptism, confirmation, that sort of thing? Where is that different from the Anglican situation? Yes and no. Um, Methodists practice infant baptism, uh, and our policy on baptism, generally speaking, is an open one. So most Methodist ministers will welcome any child who is brought to them for baptism. Um, confirmation is a, a more complex area uh, in that because of its societal roots, for a long time Methodists did not talk about being confirmed. Uh, they spoke about being made members of the Methodist Church. Uh, and indeed to this day, uh, one is both confirmed and received into membership in the service. It was only really in the period after the, the Second World War, when the, the liturgical movement was in full swing, uh, when the liturgy was coming to look more like each other, that uh, Methodists started to use the language of confirmation. Nowadays, um, if, one, if one usually becomes a Methodist by having been baptised, either as an infant or immediately before one's confirmation, and then being confirmed by the laying on of hands by the minister, and being welcomed into the Methodist Church and being given one's ticket of membership of the Methodist Church uh, in the same ceremony, and, and welcomed by the society steward as well as by, by the minister. Yes, within Anglicanism, on the, the one end you've got the, the by Catholics and the other end the evangelical and conservative. You've got something similar in Methodism where you're all extremely united. Oh, no, no, no. no, 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 no. <laughs> um, there are Methodists of different views. Uh, and so there are Methodists who would 
uh, identify themselves or be identified as what are loosely called high Wesleyans. And so they will tend to be people who um, value liturgical worship, um, whose ecumenical instinct draw them towards the Church of England and to the, to the Catholic Church, um, and um, who um, practice a, a, a sacramental understanding, so you know, Methodists who will seek out frequent communion, for instance. Um, on the other hand, you have some um, Methodists who will describe themselves very much as being low chapel or low church evangelicals, <coughs> and actually will, will, you know, um, will privilege um, the Bible as being the, the centre of uh, faith, um, will, will want to see the sacraments and uh, sacrament of the Eucharist only infrequently um, celebrated, um, who will not warm to liturgy. Um, uh, so, so, so you have those people. Um, and you have just about every position in between. Uh, in, you also have a range of um, theological positions from some extreme liberal uh, believers to some very conservative um, Christians. We hold all that together. Um, one of the, the great disappointments of Methodism in the last 50 years was the failure of the conversations between the Methodist Church and the Church of England in 1969 and 1972. And it's always seemed to me that actually you could quite easily slot the Methodist Church in somewhere between uh, the Oxford movement, Anglo-Catholics, and um, the, 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 the very um, evangelical um, low church, uh, and not really notice that, <laughs> because we, we still see the people in that structure. However, what we've never had is um, party areas. Uh, because part of the itinerant system, so Methodists have tended to move around. So we've, we've never been a practice, you know, as, as you will be aware, that because of patronage, there are some Anglican parishes that will hold to a particular ecclesial or theological tradition. Um, that's never been the case, Methodists. Neither have we had party colleges. So the evangelicals and the liberals and the, the Catholics train together. Um, you know, there, there, there are no, so we, we've, we've actually managed to avoid that. It does mean um, that there have been significant tensions on some issues. Uh, and uh, we, 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 we can fall out with each other as much uh, about um, second baptism or, or, or um, homosexuality um, or even to a gambling and drink <laughs> uh, as, as, as others, you know. But we're not homogeneous men. Sorry, you've been wet as a so we've got three more hands, so yes, here. Yeah. Um, you say that Wesley always considered himself free and angry, and I presume that those people who immediately followed probably presume the same sort of thing. When was it in Methodist church they started celebrating their own communion services and started having that sort of a definite Methodist idea towards it? It... It was happening before Wesley died, um, for two reasons. One was that Wesley himself authorised it in areas outside the Church of England. So I said that he ordained people to go to the, the, the United States of America. He also ordained people to serve societies in Scotland. Um, the other uh, thing that was happening was that people were just ignoring Wesley. <laughs> um, and were, were, were celebrating with the, and and. Um, because some of the, tra the travelling preachers, the, we the, the preachers who were, were serving the Methodist societies, uh, were in some cases ordained Anglicans. So there was always a bit of a blurring uh, of the line. Um, but there were some uh, celebrations of, of uh, Holy Communion led by lay preachers during Wesley's lifetime. Charles Wesley particularly culminated against this uh, on many occasions. After Wesley died, the conference had to decide what to do. And it agreed that um, authorised ministers in places that it said it could happen could have communion services. Uh, and that was the so called plan of classification that didn't last very long at all. Um, but it was an attempt to hold that together. Uh, but by the end of the 18th century, effectively, Methodist societies have become chapels. Um, 
the other thing that was happening was only the celebration of Holy Communion. It was also the licensing of them under the Toleration Act as dissenting places of worship that Wesley resisted. Uh, he also had a preaching house and therefore didn't need to be licensed in that way. But, you know, and, and some of the preachers got themselves licensed as authorised non-conformist minister to send him in. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much for explaining Arminianism. When I was training as a, an Anglican priest, I used to spend a week in Wesley College, Headingley, uh, <laughs> where I first heard about Arminianism and never really quite understood it. So thank you very much for that. And um, in connection with that, the Synod at Dort was a synod of what church? Calvinist church? Yes, it? yes. The, 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 it was the synod called by the leadership of the Reformed Church in the Netherlands, right. um, but included other <coughs> representatives of other Reformed churches. So it, it, it had a, a, it seems to have had a sway that was greater than the Netherlands, but effectively it was for uh, the Dutch Reformed Church. And um, if I may continue, mm -hmm. um, it strikes me um, that the, the principles of Methodism that you've uh, summarised, um, the, uh, the primacy of grace and uh, the preaching of the word, the centrality of the Bible, and so on. They're all things that, as Anglicans, we hold. But presumably, at the time Wesley was around, uh, we didn't hold them very seriously. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, could you comment on that? There's a, there's a sort of Methodist mythology that exists that says the reason that God raised Western Methodism in the 18th century was because the Church of England was such a dire state uh, and, and, and that the, the parsons were as much absentee as they were present, uh, that um, when they were in their parishes they were hunting as often as they were preaching um, and, and you could get a picture of a church that was in a pretty poor state. I don't actually think that that's really true. I think there were pockets um, where you know, there, there were abuses, clearly. Um, but uh, the Church of England was also affected by the evangelical revival. There were many Anglicans who were part of, for example, the SBCK, which was a corresponding society that was spreading the ideas of the evangelical revival. Um, some of those who identified themselves with the Methodists continued to serve as vicars or rectors in, in Anglican poetry. You know, um, Wesley's associate, John Fletcher, was the vicar of Maidley um, in, in Shropshire. Um, so uh, the new composition wasn't grim, I don't think. I think that there were two things to do One is that this was the age, though, of latitudinarianism. Uh, and that the Church of England had been affected by the whole uh, movement toward reason, uh, that there were some Anglicans uh, who were not very far from the position of deism, um, yeah, and so, so rational preacher, that rejected a lot of uh, scripture as being supernatural and therefore irrational. Uh, and, and in part, the evangelical revival and the Western movement was a response, a conservative response against that extreme um, position. The other thing is that, um, well, I don't think it was as much a theological issue as sometimes a practical issue, uh, that with the growth of population and with the tremendous social changes that were going on in England uh, in the 18th century, the parish system could not cope. Uh, and you had a, 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 a parochial system that was creaking under the strain of rapid population movements. And it wasn't really I said it's not really the 19th century church at all. But it seems to me it wasn't really until the latter part of the 19th century that the church really actually got to grips with what it needed to do in terms of establishing new dioceses, establishing not more parishes, pouring money into church building. Uh, and that happened quite rapidly in the latter part of the 19th century. But it did take some time to catch up. Because, of course, I mean, it takes an act of parliament to create a parish. I mean, it's a, a, a very complicated process. Mm -hmm. I wonder if I could just ask you something about um, a couple of the themes that, that came out really nicely in your talk, uh, the con connectional aspect and also the conference. Mm. Um, I, I really know very little about it, but I've just a hunch that the, the, um, the, the reason the 6972 thing fell apart was partly to do with church structure and church governance and oversight of the, of the life of the church. 
um, some people in the Anglican Church, church people, were a bit worried that you didn't have bishops and, um, and, and that, you know, this, well, this church wasn't being run properly. I happen to, I think if I'd been born a Methodist, I'd be very strong at this point to say, the Methodists, of course we're right, because um, to have the sort of monarchical system of someone wearing a, a crown that purports to be a mitre, you know, that's nonsense. We should really be much more biblical about it. I mean, you read about how Paul set up the, the early churches with, with a group of, of overseers, you know. So, I, I mean, I believe your, your conference and collectual system is something we, as Anglicans, really can learn from. But, but, I mean, is that how you see them in the Methodist Church? Or do you yearn to have an archbishop of uh, <laughs> <laughs> or something like that? Uh, I, I think that the Methodist Church is very different from the Anglican. One of the issues in the 6972 um, department was over uh, uh, And it, it was it, that, that one of the parties that was most vehemently opposed in the church movement were those who said these Methodists have not been properly ordained because they have not had a bishop then handle them. Wesley was very influenced in this uh, by uh, a man called Stillingfleet. Um, and through reading Stillingfleet, Wesley came to the conclusion that if you read the New Testament, there is no office of bishop that is distinguishable from that of elder. So, you know, that he, that in, in scriptural terms, anybody who'd been ordained presbyter was as much an episcopos as anybody else. Um, after Wesley's death, the author, the, one of the things that the conference very quickly desired, decided was that there wasn't going to be another king in Israel, as they put it. They didn't want another person holding the same amount of power that Wesley had. So, power is held by the conference, or authority is held by the conference, and it is our practice that the conference elects a president each year, and that when the conference decides that people should be ordained, it does two things. It admits them into full connection by standing vote. That is to say, they come under the authority of the conference. And so the authority of the conference means that I can only go where I am stationed by the conference. Uh, and the conference can do, as it has done, uh, and say, whatever plans you thought you were being made, we've decided that you will go to this post yeah, in September. Um, and the other thing it does is it, decree, it, it uh, resolves that by the laying on of hands, these people should be ordained in the history of God's society. And, they, uh, and the person who does that is the president of the conference or somebody who has been the president of the conference. Uh, and that is not because of any particular um, power vested in them. It is because in that moment they represent the conference. So we would say that conference is our bishop. And when we had the Lima conversations, uh, we said to this down to send Episcopal, that Episcopal is held collegially in the conference and exercise collegially. But it does mean that there's a division now within one of the tensions in Methodism. It's between those of us who say we could unlock the ecumenical uh, logjam if we accepted that, uh, for example, our president should be ordained by somebody in the historic uh, historic Yeah, that that solve that problem. And those who say we're not having bishops, <laughs> any price, <laughs> and we're we're, we're, we're caught in that. Thing. Who does the laying on of hands at the like the confirmation or coming into membership of the church? Um, an ordained presbyter. Oh, so, right. so, yes. like yeah. Sylvia, so is it like yeah. you? Yeah. 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 It used to be the superintendent. It was sort of historically it tended to be the superintendent minister, but now any presbyter. Yeah. But of course, it's, a, it's an Anglican. Um, ordination or consecration, that those moments or confirmation, although the bishop mm. does the main laying on hands, actually lots of others will come forward and lay on hands as well. And that's happening more and more, which perhaps is one of the little things we learn yeah. from, from, from you. Yeah. I like to feel it is. Yeah. And that's a wonderful thing, mm. I feel, for, for us to, mm. to learn how to do. Maybe we've time for one last comment or question. 
Um, John, yes. Would you have taken that last point at the recent confirmation? Bishop Stephen suddenly had the uh, inspiration that everybody mm. should stretch their hands forward. Mm. So they weren't actually laying hands on the confirmees, but they were, even from the back of the church, putting their hands forward as though they were joining him in confirmation. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that. Mm. Well, I think that's a nice point on which to end. And um, just want to say another really warm thank you, Jonathan, ever so much, because it's been a, a, a wonderful evening. We've learnt a lot, um, and uh, we've been able to discuss a great deal as well. Thank you so much for coming over.